Getting ready to take on your lawn? Make your first move with the reliable performance and power of steel tools. From hedge trimmers and mowers to string trimmers and more, right now save on select gas tools starting at just $149.99. Real steel. Find yours at steeldealers.com. State Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo know making smarter financial moves today secures a financial freedom for a successful tomorrow. Now we have a level of privilege that our parents never had. So what do we do with it, right? How do we how do we utilize the opportunities that we have that they don't, right? And a lot of that is educating ourselves, educating ourselves on how to not make the same mistakes they did. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. State Farm, proud sponsor of My Cultura Podcast Network. It's time for a Big Blue Kickoff Live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Monday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. Thank you so much for being with us, folks. We'll be here for the next hour to talk Giants football and any other NFL issues you'd like to discuss. I'm Paul Dottino. He's Matt Zytek, and we're so glad you could be with us. It's 201-939-4513. If you'd like to give us a call, 201 939 45 one, three. And as always, if you don't catch us live, you can always go to the archive and our entire podcast network is on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcasts. All right, let's just dispense with all the pleasantries and go right to the news of the day, Matt. Let's do it. Uh, Brian Dable told us that Malik Neighbors did not get his foot stepped on. Okay, he made that very clear. I know there have been various reports about all kinds of things, like he got his foot caught in a food processor. He got his foot caught in a George Foreman grill. I understand all that stuff, okay? I get all of it. But but we're here to tell you the facts as we know them. Uh, and I think, to be frank with you, the way I interpreted uh, Coach Dable's uh, announcement earlier this morning is that there does not seem to be too much to worry about. But I will let Matt explain. You were there as well. Uh, why don't you tell the folks what Coach had to say? Yeah, so to a surprise to no one, <clears throat> that was the first thing Coach was asked this morning. What a shock. The first several questions. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, Coach doesn't, as we know, does not love to shed too much light when it comes to injuries. But I got the sense, it seemed like everyone kind of get the sense, that they don't think this is a serious injury. Uh, he said that Malik Neighbors is sore. I mean, that would be expected after injuring your your ankle or whatever it was, your foot the day before. He said he was sore, going through, still going through some evaluations, but the sense that they got is that it is nothing serious. They're going to take it day by day. He didn't practice today, and so they're not, there's no reason to rush him back. I mean, obviously he is a rookie. You would like to see him. You know, in an ideal world, you would love to see him get at least some game reps with Daniel Jones in an actual game, not just a practice setting. But it's too early to tell about, you know, his status for Saturday. But it, look, you never know. Coach, you know, he wouldn't definitively say anything because why would he? There's no reason to. But he said that they don't think, it does not look like, it is any sort of fracture or on the more serious end of the the spectrum of mm -hmm. what this injury could have been. Mm -hmm. So given the fact that he did, you know, get a little banged up yesterday, it seems like this was, you know, pretty positive news on, on that front. Now, again, because he went for evaluations today, that's the reason he, we didn't see him on the practice field. I yeah. don't want people to think that he wasn't there because something else had popped up or that it was something serious. No, he was getting more evaluations. Yes. That's all. They're just trying to be very careful, as they should. The guy's the number one draft pick, okay? <laughs> they got to be prudent here. Coach did say, however, and let's make this very clear, and he was, he was absolutely emphatic about this. When he's cleared to go and he's ready, he will work. 
They're not holding him out once he gets the okay. No. So, I mean, it's pretty simple. They're not going to put kit gloves on him and say, oh, just because, you know, he is a valued member of this offense that they're going to hold him back and hold him out. Coach said he's a rookie. He still needs reps. So once he's cleared, he'll be back out there again. Now, they may ramp him up or they may cut down his workload a little bit, but I have absolutely no hesitation in believing that once the medics say he's fine, he's out there. They're not holding him back. No. Yeah, Coach made that very clear. He was pretty much asked straight up about that. and that's Like exactly, three times. Yeah, it's exactly what he said. When the medical staff give Malik Neighbors the green light, they're throwing him back out there, as they should. Every rep for a rookie is so valuable during mm-hmm. training camp because they've never performed at this level, obviously, in the NFL. LSU, you know, SEC football, very high level. It's the best conference there is in college football, but it's not the same as playing in the NFL. So you want the rookies to get as many reps, whether it's practice or game, you know, joint practice or just your team going. Like You want it out there as much as possible while still, you know, being safe. And so Dable said, as soon as he gets the green light, he will be back out there, which is uh, good to hear. Okay, what else did he tell us today? Well, he reaffirmed that Jones is going to play against Houston as long as the week goes okay and there's nothing that would red flag him from taking the field against the Texans. He also said that Hyatt, Slayton and Wandell Robinson, among his other starters, will see a lot of reps. I mean, everything seems to be going exactly as the coach wanted it to. He had, he had planned, he mentioned the other day, that he thought that he would get a lot of his starters some reps in this game anyway. So this is like not a surprise. Um, nothing's been derailed, I guess is really what I'm trying to say, by anything that's happened so far. Correct. I mean, nothing of the overall plan. Right. You know, there are some guys that, you know, last week coach may have thought these guys are going to play against the Texans that given, you know, we'll see what happens in practice. Drew Locke is the one minor example, right? Drew Locke is one example. like he'll play. It's kind of unlikely. He hasn't, coach has not ruled him out though. And Drew, Drew Locke also, Drew Locke also spoke to the media after practice and he, reaffirmed that he said i have not been ruled out there's still a chance but we're gonna have to see how the week goes and see how his recovery goes from right. from the injury he didn't necessarily say it was the hip he just said it was the hip general area he said there's a four inch gap between his his rib protector and his pads down on his thigh he says there's a four inch gap there and that's where he landed and got hurt that four-inch gap, which is right there, like kind of right near the hip bone. Uh, he said it's sore. He'd never been injured there before. He's already started to throw the last couple of days. Yep. And he said they'll keep going day by day and throwing. And if he feels better, he's saying there's a chance he could play against Houston. And Dable said the same thing. Neither guy would say 100% he's out for the game. And I understand why. Locke needs the reps. He said his execution was not good the other night. He didn't see the safety on the badly thrown interception in the first quarter against Detroit. So you know he's anxious to get out there and put some better stuff on tape. For sure. For sure. I mean, at the same time, as we know, they're they're not going to let him go out there unless... If he can't go. If he can't go. And he said today, it's a little... He was asked, is this a pain tolerance issue or a risk of injuring it even further issue. And he, Drew said a little bit of both right now. Right. So, you know, we'll see if the next four days can, you know, clear either of those things up a little bit and make it so, it you know, maybe it's just the pain tolerance thing and there is no, you know, risk of injuring it further. We don't know. We'll have to see how the week goes. But, yeah, overall – Dable's plan, or the supposed plan for Saturday, seems to be on track. The only guys that, you know, we might see a couple of guys from both sides of the ball that are just a little banged up. There's no guarantee that those guys will play. You know, John Michael Schmitz and Evan Neal, who were both, for the second straight day, returned to practice, only doing individual drills. Mm-hmm. Dable said he doesn't know if, like, those two guys will suit up on Saturday. You, you gotta to ramp see. them up. Yeah, you gotta ramp them up, you know. Drew Phillips did not practice today. Coach said they're backing him off a little bit. 
with a little bit of a sore ankle. Depending on how the week goes, we'll see if he gets into the game. Right. But it's it's situations like that. It's you know a couple of individual players from both sides of the ball that we'll just have to see how their rehab goes over the next few days before we see get a sense of whether or not they're going to suit up on Saturday. I tell people all the time when they ask me about training camp injuries or preseason injuries, I tell them all the time, listen, the details and the minutia aren't that important. I said, here's the question you really want to answer. And it's quite frankly the question that I usually ask people off to the side. Simple. If there's a regular season game this weekend, do you think the guy's going to play? That's really the litmus test, okay? Yep. Because... Somebody sitting out a preseason game or preseason practices, that doesn't really tell you the degree of injury. No. It really doesn't. No. Okay. And I suspect outside of maybe Locke and certainly Neil and Schmitz because they're coming back slowly from, from ailments, I don't get the sense that anybody else may be at risk if they were to play a regular season game this week. That's kind of the sense I get. I won't say that definitively, but that's kind of the sense I get. Well, I mean, flat, flat. I was gonna say flat. Flat's got the quad now. Deontay it, Johnson. Uh, I mean, Deontay Johnson was prepared to go back in the game the other night. Now I know yeah. they've held him out since, but he he was back on the bench and and he was like, "Coach, yeah, I'm you, ready." You gotta wonder how much of that was just adrenaline, and you know, he Could've knows been. he knows the situation he's and in, and he wants a roster fighting spot. for a roster spot. Badly does he want a roster so, spot? Yeah, him wanting to go back in the game on Thursday. That Who knows? Surprise Who me. knows? All right, but certainly, uh, for the most part, I, I get the impression that we're not talking anything really serious here for any of these guys. Yeah, that's the sense I get too. And you know, we follow everything that happens across the league, and you know, there have been so many teams stricken by the injury bug like serious injuries so you never want to see anyone go down you never want to see anyone miss any practice but you know just knock on wood it i told you i got the giant can of insecticide out in the spring <laughs> and i sprayed the entire meadowlands area i did not spray spray foreman park <laughs> but i did spray the meadowlands area so it's going to be okay well then in about 10 days, you're going to have to go to Florida Park and spray it for that one joint. Exactly, practice. right? That's a good point. 201-939-4513 is our phone number. Uh, if you'd like to give us a call, we'll be here again for uh, up until 2 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, we do have one caller on, so why don't we hit him up first? We'll get to our promos in just a second. Marcus is from Oregon. You are first on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, Paul. Hey, Matt. Usually from Portland, but I'm calling you guys from the beautiful beach of Manasquan today. Okay. Nice. I just wanted to talk about the offense. Uh, fantastic job on Thursday, but now we're kind of in a pickle because the running backs look great. So we can't keep four. What's going to be the big deal? Like, who are we going to keep? Who are we Champagne gonna keep, problems, my man. Yeah, I was going to say, to start, <laughs> this is a good problem to have, especially considering, you know, a week ago from right now, a lot of people were questioning – if the Giants even had like a real number two running back on the team. And now, right. now we're talking about which of these three guys, which two of them might make the team. So first off, that is a good issue to have. You know what I liked about the other night? You guys finally saw what we've been seeing in Tracy ever since camp opened. This Ooh. kid can play. I'm convinced he's the number two back on the depth chart right behind Singletary. Really? I'm, oh, I'm, I'm convinced of that. I, uh, it's his number two spot to lose. And Gray Definitely. showed the other night, in fact, he's been doing it now for about a week or so, why he was picked in the draft last year. He has certainly right. picked up his level, and I think he understood he needed to because he got off to a very slow start. And Dante Miller was, uh, was creating some sparks. And, in fact, he had a good night against the Lions, too. Mm -hmm. When it comes to yeah. Gray, I think, you know, last year, and I'm pretty sure he's spoken about this, the Giants threw him in as, you know, the returner last year. And mm -hmm. that's that's not a role that he had, like, as much experience in, obviously, as running back. And when you're trying to get the hang of just playing in the NFL as a rookie, and then on top of that, you're basically playing a position that you, you – don't feel like a hundred percent comfortable or as comfortable as you do playing running back. It, it weighs on your mind. And you know, when Eric Gray was speaking, yeah. when Eric Gray spoke in the locker room after the game, 
he said that he kind of he said that he was kind of just overthinking things a little bit last year and this year he just wanted to show people who he is who he knows that he is and he knows how he can play and obviously it's only been one preseason game and some practices too but he's definitely shown you know the burst that had everyone excited about him going into last year he was miscast as a rookie it's that simple and he knows it and joe shane came out and told everybody that after the season he kind of force fed him into the return game on the coaches and said that was on me it's it was a mistake yeah, because not, not every running back is a returner, so it wasn't fair to evaluate him that way. I mean, he got a few ch- uh, shots last season, you know, when Barkley went down, but that was behind the, the god-awful offensive line. Well, Matt Breda was technically the number two last year. He's now in San Francisco, by the way. We signed with the yep. Niners this week. I saw. You know, like, like, having this many good running backs in the room is a great problem to have, but, you know, now, now it comes down to where are we going to keep an extra running back? Or are we going to keep an extra quarterback? Because we know for sure, like, I love Daniel. He's a good player. But he hasn't had more than one full healthy season. So we can't rely on his health to keep us afloat this season. We have to have a reliable backup. I'm going to tell you what, Marcus. I don't think that's the question. I think they're going to keep three quarterbacks. I, I think, think Daddy. I think I think Tommy DeVito, unless he screws it up, he will be the third quarterback on the fifty-three. I think what you're jockeying is how many receivers, how many tight ends, how many defensive backs, how many offensive linemen, how many running backs. Those positions I think are in flux. I'm I am now convinced that Tommy DeVito has to stay as the number three. Yeah. Yeah. If I had to I, guess I, at this exact moment, I would probably say the same thing and in terms of the running backs i mean again this is a good problem to have but we still got a couple weeks left before this, we the roster cut down and as we've seen time and time again a lot can change in a matter of days let alone weeks so mm-hmm. so can change yeah. on one play exactly so like while i fully you know understand your question and stuff all i would have to say is like it was a great performance by those three running backs on thursday Let's see him do it again. Let's see how they perform Absolutely. against Houston and then against the Jets. Those will be – and in the joint practice against the Jets. Those will be, you know, give us, I would think, a better idea of who will probably make the roster when we get a little bit closer to cut down day. Right. This is the one thing that kind of makes me worry about keeping three quarterbacks is, like you were saying, like other positions are going to sacrifice. And I don't want to lose someone like DJ Davidson who's done some flashes and everything. But, like, I feel like – that's a position that's kind of on the chopping block right now since we have a lot of players in that position that are good. Well, it remains to be seen. Again, is there going to be a position that's gimpy? Like, Flott's got the quad. We just talked about that a second ago. Okay? If for some reason that lingers or another DB goes down, specifically a corner, they're going to have to keep another corner. That's just the way it goes. So, see... What people don't sometimes understand is that a player is not necessarily competing against himself or a teammate in the room or even a guy on the waiver wire. Sometimes he's competing for just a generic roster spot against another position. And that's often overlooked and forgotten about. Yeah, I mean, we, we've heard Joe Shea in the last two cutdown days talk about how it's not just, you know, you want to just put the best 53 players on the roster, but there are other factors that come into it. And he's talking, spoken about how you sort of have to play like roster gymnastics and put the different pieces of the puzzle together because you're not, you can't just look at like one position in a vacuum because it really is a puzzle that you're putting together at every single position. Right. All right, Marcus. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no problem. One last thing, gentlemen. Yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, because I haven't called in a while, I just want to say one thing about a defensive player. I really like Tyler Newbin. I think he's going to be the future of this team. And I'll take your answers off the air. Hope you both have a great rest of your day. Go Giants. All right, Marcus. Thanks, thanks Marcus. for the call. Everybody here likes Tyler Newbin, too. I mean, I loved him. <laughs> Once we made the draft pick, I was already, like, watching some highlights and some interviews of him. I'm like, this this guy is going to be a very popular guy here. And so far, since he got back onto the field after missing that first week, his play is backed up my thoughts from the offseason. It's another really good problem because Pinnock has been solid and Belton has done well to the point where Shane Bowen said the other day, it's Belton's job to lose. Yeah. So we're looking right now at what we think
think, are three very talented safeties on that part of the depth chart. Speaking of Pinnock and Belton, both of them during one-on-ones today at the start of practice, mm-hmm. both had interceptions. Mm-hmm. Made very nice plays on the ball. Let, let, let's quickly go over uh, 11-on-11s today. Offensively, it was not a great day. It was clearly a day for the defense. Uh, Hyatt did catch a touchdown pass down the right sideline on a goal route from uh, Daniel Jones. But for the most part, I had DeVito uh, on a uh, on a bootleg for a touchdown where they faked out the entire defense and ran it in. And to be frank with you, on 11 on 11s, uh, those were really the best plays for me, Dan. I, I'm, uh, I mean, uh, um, Matt, I saw defensively. Uh, we had what I thought was a diving interception for Newbin, but now he was telling us he didn't hold the ball. No, he said he did hold it. He said he did hold it. In the, in the scrum in the field house before, he said, for sure, I caught that. And I was standing right there. He caught they, it. But they didn't rule it that way. No, one, I, one I think the, the rest one of, did. One of the officials did not. And that's why they conferred. And I don't know what they eventually decided. I was under the impression that they ruled it in. Well, that's good. And that's I was good. standing right there. It certainly looked like it. That was on the that was on the goal line drill. I was on the other yeah. on the other pylon. You were on the far pylon. I was on the uh, this pylon. I wa- anyway, I watched that back. It looks like a catch to me. We like it. Yeah. I, okay. I, it looks like a, now it, that was a, a cager was the intended receiver, and Newbin made a diving attempt at. Now what he was just talking about in the field house was, he's like in the NCAA when you go down, you're down. He goes, now we're in the NFL. I got to remember, I can get up and I can take that ball the other way. Um, so he's, this guy's, this guy's going to be really good. So, but, so that was a sweet play. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll say that was a pick. Uh, I also saw uh, two sacks for uh, DJ Davidson. I saw, uh, let's see here. McFadden had a pass defense, which was very sweet. And we also had Alex Johnson with a really sweet pass defense as well. Uh, was there anything else that caught your eye? Uh, well, I think we got to spend a little bit more time talking about that DJ to Hyatt touchdown because the way fun. you just described it did not do it justice because, no, no, that was, first of all, the Giants were lined up, I want to say, around their own 20-yard line. Oh, it was a bomb. And this ball had at least 50 yards in the air, at least. Might mm-hmm. have been more, 50 to 60 well, yards. that's what a go route usually is. No, I know, but... The Daniel Jones placed the ball, dropped it in perfectly. Where yes. Jalen Hyatt did not break his stride at all, caught it. I, I forgot who was the defender. It might have been Pinnock Belton. or Belton. Bel- Belton was back there. Was and right so, there. And so was McLeod. Hyatt caught it, I would say, just inside the 20-yard line. But it was just basically Hyatt and, I guess, Belton. And in my opinion, again, I was standing pretty close to there. Hyatt would have easily – like, Belton did not have a good tackle on him. Where, Belt, where Hyatt easily would have walked into the end zone for a touchdown, would have probably been like an 80-yard touchdown pass. And it was just well, a, I scored beautiful, it a touchdown pass. beautiful, like perfect, perfect pass by Daniel Jones. Great catch by Jalen Hyatt. You know, it was contested. Belton was right there. Mm-hmm. But he outran him, as we've come to see Jalen Hyatt do since he got here. Just we needed to go into a little bit more detail okay. about that. Because that was – okay. Uh, I, I, I hope – we caught that on camera and can, you know, post it up on giant social media, but I don't know if we did. So I just wanted to give that play a little more justice. It was a routine professional go route folks, but I appreciate you being uh, overzealous. I expect that from Daniel Jones. I expect that from Jalen Hyatt. This is to me expected. Yeah, I but didn't see it as being you so expect to overly see spectacular. Fifty plus air yard perfect pass every practice. Not every we practice. We haven't seen it every practice. Not every practice. Sounds okay. You need to get into right. it a little bit more. Hey, when a, point, when guys make a great plays, you gotta give I lo- them their props. I love it. I love it. It wasn't great. It was the first play I, I just had, I know, but it was I, the play I, just, of I thought you were gonna go into it. It's clearly easily the play of the day. I of course. I just don't want to drool over it because it wasn't a practice against the Lions. No. It wasn't a practice against another team. This was Giants on Giants, and to be honest. But most any, of these practices any, are Giants for right, Giants. Right, which is Doesn't why you, you can't, can't get excited you, you about good plays. You can't drool over these practices. There's, there's got to be a That's limit. almost to, every practice, There's got to be though. a limit to the drool. So we can only drool at three practices I, all training camp? All right. 
I'm, I'm just trying to maintain composure here, folks. Some people get way carried away. I don't know what to tell you. It's all right, though. It's uh, all right. I'll also say after that, or on the, in the same period yes. as that Jalen Hyatt yes. what touchdown. Yes, what did you like? I just like the first team offense stayed on the field after that because that was, I think, like the first play. So they clearly wanted to get more reps. Correct. And What was the second play? Singletary, Singletary, Singletary. was the first play. Hyatt was the second play. Okay, second play. But – during that period where the first team offense was out on the field, I had Daniel Jones down for only one incompletion, and correct. for at least five completions. He was five out of six. On five that out of six. That's with correct. A, some nice passes with a touchdown. With the touchdown, which was spectacular, by the way. There we Over go. Over the top. That's what I was looking for. Light up the lights of the scoreboard on Times Square. It was sensational. There we go. Two zero one nine three nine. What else? Oh, your guy. Oh, five one three. Your you know guy. I, you know I like the bust. Of on course. You. Okay, uh, go your, ahead. What do you your got? guy Ryder Anderson had a nice batted ball at the line of scrimmage. Yes, he did. Yes, in he the did. Oh, face. you know what? I I must I must not have. Uh, let me see here. And for some reason, no. You know what? I did not mention that. I'm sorry because I do. You're right. He is one of my guys. And then at, towards the very end of practice, he had another pressure that probably would have been a sack. Could have been. Could have. Yep. Could have been. Not yep. definite, but. Yep. He had a good practice. I thought the tight ends of anyone that other than that one play, I thought Theo Bellinger Johnson had a Johnson. couple plays, but Bellinger especially, I think this was one of his stronger practices of the summer. I think if we went back and counted it up, this was one of those practices where they got a lot yeah. of targets. Some of them on like tight end screens and then others. You and know, they weren't probably. necessarily big, deep targets downfield. No. But but they got a lot of burn today, both Bellinger and Theo Johnson. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, nothing spectacular, but just workmanlike. And yeah. they got the ball and did something that they had to do with it. So, anyway, all right. Uh, 201 939 4513. Rich and Forest Hills, you're next on the program. Hello. Hey, guys. How's it going today? All good. good. How are you? Good, good. Uh, tight ends make sense because that's what I was calling about. Uh, obviously, the roster cut downs and things and the number of people at each position has been a big topic. Paul, I think you and John last week did a thing on how many tight ends and running backs combined. Uh, one thing I noticed in the game, and I know these play calls are vanilla, was a lot of tackle eligible, not just in the red zone, but between the 20s. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that's kind of alluding to maybe only keeping three tight ends? Is that a formation that they're, they're working a bit more? Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm going to warn you about. What you see in the preseason games is really pared down. And so I don't want you to take anything you see there and automatically assume that that's going to be a tendency in the regular season. That's, that's just a friendly warning. Now, what we've seen at camp is a lot of stuff and a lot of player deployments that we cannot talk about. So how's that for an answer that will let you scratch your head for a little while? <laughs> Uh, it's gonna let me scratch my head for another week and a half, I guess. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm just I'm, look. I'm trying to be crystal clear with you as much as I can be. How about that? Yeah, that's fair enough. And then uh, yeah, that's all I had. And then lastly, small sample size, but Drew Phillips looks the part. Uh, you know, big yeah. coming down into the box, making the tackle, and uh, I think they're loving him. That's all I had, guys. I'll take it off the air. But thanks so much. Great, thanks, uh, Rich. Uh, unfortunately, we mentioned uh, Phillips a little bit tweaked right now, but. He's got a lot of really good reviews so far. Oh, yeah. I mean, we saw it in Hard Knocks. I, I believe it was Joe Shane that said it. He's a dog. And we know that this is a term that the team is embracing this year, the dog, D-A-W-G. But mm -hmm. everything that Drew Phillips has shown has been that, whether it's practice against the Giants, practice against the Lions, the preseason opener against the Lions. Like, he is not afraid to get his – get into the middle – of the play, no matter who is on the other side, he is not a, like. I think he might already be one of the tougher guys on this defense, and he's a rookie. I think that's possible. You you know what's funny, and I know this is going to sound really dumb, but it's kind of true. And you've been here, so you you'll understand when I say this. You got guys like Newbin, guys like Belton, guys like Phillips. These guys are in the back seven, right? They're in the secondary. Forget this, the back seven. They're in the secondary. That's even further back. And what did they always talk about? First, it's being physical. They don't talk about necessarily, even Newbin. He understands he's a ball hawk. But we said his first priority was, I think, about being physical. 
I don't think that's a coincidence. This Giants team has some guys who really want to get their noses dirty. Yeah. Right? You sense the same thing. A hundred percent. I mean, again, I don't want to keep bringing up hard knocks, but like we, well, we saw the conversations of Joe Shane and the other members of the front office talking about these guys before the draft in the lead up. That was like the main thing that they spoke about for almost every one of those guys. At least Newbin and Phillips for sure. Yeah. They discussed how physical those guys were. And honestly, I think it was the first or second play Newbin was on the field against the Lions where he just went and blew mm-hmm. up that 300 pound offensive lineman on the Lions. And I believe it was Deontay Johnson was able to run right in, tackle yep. the runner. I think it was a third down play or it was, you know, short yardage. He put and they the were trying guard to run right on his back. He put the guard right on his back and cleared the path for Deontay Johnson that's to come ridiculous. in and take, make the tackle. When you think about that, that's it's, ridiculous. That's that should crazy. not happen. And that was just one play. I mean, we've seen both Newbin and Phillips show that physicality and that toughness in practice. Almost every day. And it sounds crazy, right? Because football's physical by its very definition in nature, right? But no, you don't always get defensive backs who prioritize that. They're more interested in, oh, I want to be sticky in coverage. I want to anticipate the ball. I want to get an interception. I want to show that I have good enough hands that I can make those picks. These defensive backs are not like that. Even, no. even Tate Banks, when he got here last year, talked about how physical he wanted to be. Yeah. All right. Quickly, folks, let you know, Run or Walk with Giants Legends, the Giants Foundation will host a 5K Racing Kids Run presented by Quest on Saturday, September 7th at 9 a.m. at MetLife Stadium. Net proceeds will benefit the Giants Foundation. All participants will receive a commemorative T-shirt after the race stay for a post-race festival with appearances by Giants Legends and a live DJ. Register now at Giants.com slash 5K. And remember, free and open to the public, the Giants Fan Fest will take place on Friday, September 6th, presented by Wendy's. We'll celebrate 100 seasons of New York Giants football with a ceremony honoring the top 100 Giants, autographs and panel discussions by Giants legends, historic displays, photos with the Lombardi trophies, and an incredible drone light and fireworks show to end the night. Get your tickets now by visiting Giants.com slash FanFest. Giants Huddle Podcast has Giants and NFL interviews all over the place. Plenty of them there. They're long form. You get a lot of detail, a lot of great insight. You can find them on your favorite podcast platforms or go to Giants.com slash podcasts. Giants season ticket memberships for 2024 are available. Stay connected to the team all year round. Uh, To learn more about exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory, of course, is available And Giants TV is the free app where you can get all kinds of streaming video, game highlights, etc. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. That does it for today's promos. We go back to the phones, and line one has Len from Columbia. You're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Boy, just just like the big time folks. You do the promos, and then you lead into Len from Columbia. That's great. Well, we need to promote you all the time. Anytime you're on this program, Len, we know it's going to be good, so bring it now. (laughs) Perfect timing. Hey, good to talk to you guys. Um, All right, Tuesday coming around and and the release of another 10 all-time great Giants. Uh, I I don't know why I'm so caught up in this, guys, but I I just really love this. Good. I think it's been the the highlight of this, uh, you know, celebration of the 100th, uh, 100th season. And I'm just following it closely and, you know, can't wait for late morning tomorrow in the next 10. Uh, we're, we're really starting to get into royalty territory now with uh, <laughs> 31 through 40. Holy cow. Um, on the game on Thursday, a couple of comments on the game on Thursday night. I, I, I think you guys are right, and you've been talking about this now for a couple of shows. Um, the phys- physicality just really stood out. Holy cow. Um, I, I think it, it showed the difference between the two teams. Um, I, I know we're playing second and third stringers, and who knows about conditioning, but, geez, we, we had the better players on the field the other night. Len, I'm going to give you cow. one thing. Go back if you haven't, you haven't done it. I don't do it during the preseason. I don't log missed tackles during the preseason. But offhand, now I was down on the field. I was on the sideline the whole night in, in the rain. But I will yeah. tell you this. Did you see more than two or three? I don't think so. No, no, not really. Um, 
And you know that that's a good well, sign. That's, that's a really good. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's a really good sign. And it doesn't oh, matter if yeah. they're backups or not. Yeah. When you got yeah. guys yeah. bringing other people down, uh, yeah. it says a lot about the mentality yeah. and yeah. also the yeah. fundamentals that your defense is executing. Yes, yes, yes. And um, you know that that takes. Um, a little more than technique. I mean, that takes purpose and focus. I mean, you you <laughs> at that level in that game, as as tough as these players are, you you got to really want to make that tackle, Paul. And so I'm glad you brought that up because that that was true. It showed me it some deep focus. But I mean, across the line, um, geez, the back seven on defense. I mean. Did we, uh, yeah, those second and third stringers, yeah, wow. I mean, you know, they all kind of stood out. They were in the backfield. They were chasing down ball carriers, knocking passes down. Uh, really pretty impressive. And along the offensive line, too. Geez, I, I thought we dominated on the offensive line. You know, it took me like six, seven, maybe first eight plays and I, I, I'm looking at the screen, and I, I thought to myself, who the heck's playing right tackle? <laughs> <laughs> the guy just stood out. I mean, Joshua Miles. Have I got the first name right, Paul? Yes. yes. He, he no. actually has done some good things at camp, and of the deep offensive linemen on the chart, he's kind of moved himself up a little bit. Yeah. Geez, he looked. You know, you watch him, and I mean, the technique. I don't know a lot about offensive line plays here, but just a couple of things that stood out to me. Um, you know, his technique, he seemed to be in position. He stayed between the, you know, the guy he was blocking and the quarterback, and just good balance in his feet. And I kept thinking, oh, geez, I hope Evan Neal has that back. <laughs> has that balance when he gets back and when he gets back on the field but he he kind of stood out and the other guy that stood out for me on the line um uh, you know the guy we we signed in the off season who played with tampa stinney mm -hmm. uh, he just looks like he knows what he's doing guys i mean he just looks like a, a professional offensive guard you know uh, he didn't play what he played maybe 10 plays but he, he looked like the best offensive lineman on the field from played. Um, and those, the, I mean, the second and third string linebackers, uh, again, uh, I mean, Boogie looks like maybe he's going to make this team. You know, he's just, just it, it was it was fun to, it was kind of fun to watch, and it just goes to prove um, this is, this is a, just a better roster of people. Yeah, and we'll see what happens as we go through the rest of the preseason. Um, you, know, you know, back to the tackling, and Paul, I know you like Darnay Holmes, uh, and I do too. And the, the reason why I liked Holmes, and I have liked him from day one, Paul, mm -hmm. I know they just discovered. I know they just discovered he can play special teams. It's amazing. It took him four years to figure that out, but um, he gets people on the ground. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like Holmes. He's a tough little dude. Comes from a tough part of Los Angeles, and he'll oh, tell you anytime you ask him. I know, I know him, the background. A yeah, very background. rugged area in yeah. Los Angeles, and he takes yeah. that with him every day. Yes, he does. He does. And he just, if he gets his hands on you, you're going down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope he might. I know he didn't. It, it looks like um, that Trey Herndon may be. Maybe a step ahead of him at this point, but and I, but I hope Darnay comes through. I've always liked him from day one. I like the guy. Yep. So hey, listen, good, um, you know, good effort the other night. It was fun to watch, and uh, I was a little surprised. Now, on the disappointment side, um, I I don't know about the quarterbacks. You know, you can, I got fingers crossed. Come on, Daniel. You know, one stay healthy. Um, I don't know. I I thought. The way the team was playing, the way the running backs were, were you know, performing, I, I thought maybe we should have scored more points, Paul. I was a little disappointed in um, in Locke. Um, but, again, first preseason game. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we'll see what happens. And Tommy is Tommy. I mean, you know, um, we gotta keep, we're going to keep three quarterbacks. I mean, there's no question we can't, we can't take the chance. Um I don't know about the, you know the running back numbers. 
You know, if you keep four, you're only going to dress three. What are you keeping four for? Go get somebody else at another position. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I liked the way he played the other night. Um, kind of opened my eyes a little bit. Although we saw a little bit of the end of last season in, in gray. Um, maybe he's odd man out. What do you think? I would be very surprised. Well, you said Tracy was ahead of him. Tracy, I think Tracy is ahead of him. But to say that Gray's... Uh, if you say Gray's the odd man out, I'm assuming you mean he, you think he's going to get cut when you say that. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah, think yeah. he gets cut. Okay. I think he has the edge over Dante Turbo Miller at this point because he has a year of experience here in the system and he yeah. you know, played his tail off in the, se- yeah. in the opener. Okay. But I think that... The running back position these last these next two preseason games is going to be one of the most intriguing mm-hmm. position battles we're going to see. And Len, to be frank, because yeah. Turbo Miller played at Columbia University yeah. okay. and then didn't okay. get many snaps at South Carolina, yeah. you probably yeah. have a better chance on sneaking him onto the practice squad than you do yeah. in Eric Gray. Everybody knows yeah. who Eric Gray is. He was yeah. not like an undrafted rookie free agent. Yeah. Okay. Well, he was a well, mid-round draft choice. And a mid-round yeah. draft choice who gets cut in his second season is going to yeah. attract attention. Yeah. yeah um, well, are, are you guys then leaning toward the idea that we'll keep three? I haven't decided yet, to be honest. If I had to guess right now, given yeah, yeah. some of the yeah, in, some of the uh, injuries at other positions, I yeah. would lean more towards three running backs. But again, it, depending yeah. on how these guys play and if other positions get healthier, these running backs, the four of them, could force Joe Shane's hand to keep four of them. Yeah. You know, here's the one yeah. thing we do know, okay? Tracy and Turbo Miller. Now, we'll rule Gray out of this because it didn't work so well on the return game last year. So we'll rule oh, him no. out of oh, this. God. But Tracy yeah, yeah. and Turbo Miller can both they, return kicks. They both have yeah, yeah. extensive it's, experience it's, returning kicks. So, so yeah. you know... Len, it's going to work itself out one way or the other. I, I yeah, think yeah. all four running backs should be in the building in September. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm yeah. really not ready to use a Sharpie permanent marker and say which three. Yeah. I know yeah. during the course of camp, Miller Miller, and, and, and Tracy seem to perform better day-to-day during training camp than Gray. And then the last week or so, Gray has picked it up. And he's gone right into that fray, and he's kind of evened the whole thing out. Yeah. Just hope that all four are in the building, okay? That's the best yeah, That's yeah, the going, best I could say. Yeah, yeah. Go, going back to Gray for a second, you, you brought something up, both brought something up that I think was important is the special teams aspect. I mean, he's just, you know, the other three guys uh, or, or the, 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 you know, the two, Tracy, I mean, you see them doing some other things and possibly fitting in on special teams. I don't see Gray fitting in on special teams in any shape, manner, or form. Um well, we'll see what happens there. I think the difference in the the backup linebacker situation is going to be how well these guys play the pass. God, they got a nose for the ball. I mean, even that sixth round pick, the kid from UCLA. Wow, Musa. He's got, yeah, I tell you, there's some intangibles with that guy. Paul, Gary, reasons. No, not even close. In what way? Look you mean at look wise? look. You mean talent wise? Talent talent wise and also build, they're not the same. Oh, that, Reasons was a much okay. bigger, much bigger, more, yeah, much yeah. more sturdy player. Yeah, yeah. And much more well, physical you, at the point of attack too. You know, let me say. I one mean, that's Bobby Humphrey of the Broncos about Gary Reasons. Yeah, let me let me say one thing about Reasons now that we that we brought him up because I always thought when Gary Reasons was on the field, Paul. Good things happened for the Giants. Yeah, well, he was a it just seemed, he it was just a football like player. Reasons did not have great athleticism. He was just a really good yeah. football player. I and I I just you know you know the Lawrence Taylor shoulder game Thanksgiving weekend 1988. I I was by the Giants tunnel as they were coming out, and the first guy that presented himself because he's from that area of the, of the mm-hmm. world as you know mm-hmm. he's from down there in Louisiana. Mm-hmm was Gary Reasons, yeah. and um, I, I yelled to Gary, as I often tried to do with some of the players. He complete, He was by himself. He completely ignored me. 
but smart totally, man. <laughs> but listen, no, Len, go ahead. But, but Paul, no, they, let me let me finish the story. But so totally focused, that guy's eyes were on that field, and I thought to myself, I I wouldn't want to play against this guy tonight. Len, he made up for his lack of athleticism. There was something going on. Yeah, he had that smarts so... and instincts and anticipation. And that's oh. what made him the player that he was. Len, yeah. I got to go. We got a lot of calls yeah, yeah, still yeah. on the line. Good. Hey, thanks. Hey, Be good. Thanks. good. Thank, Thank you. 201 939 4513. Alex in Syracuse, you're next on the show. Hello. Hey, guys. How are we doing today? Hi. Hey, Alex. Hey, if I can't follow promos, following Len's got to be the next best spot on the show, I think. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, I got two, two things for you today. Um, it's actually kind of to tag on to the running back discussion you were just having with Len. I, I like everybody, seems to feel like we got a pretty good room so far after one game, like you said, Matt. Uh, we got to see where it pans out. But what I found interesting today is the, the addition of Lorenzo Lingard, which, again, I know, you know, it's, we're in the time of the season, people come and go, but I thought it was interesting that to, to move a spot to bring in another running back, given the situation, seeming like we almost already have, you know, more than we can handle. I just wonder... Do you think that's a special teams thing? There's not a lot of tape on him right now that I can see, even out on the internet highlights and stuff. Do you have any sense of, of what that what that bringing in of Lingard might be about? All right, so just to get people caught up, they got rid of Sailors, the yeah, uh, spring league running back yesterday. Okay, one of the reasons he was supposedly brought here was because of his uh, experience on the new kickoff return rule, because he mm-hmm. did some of that in the spring league. Obviously, he was way behind the other backs. And so he is gone. And now they bring in Lorenzo Lingard uh, out of uh, Miami, who played for the Hurricanes. He started there. Yes. He went to three different schools. Correct. Miami, Florida, and then Akron. Yes. Uh, Known, though, primarily, I think he was known for Miami first, right? He had two years in Miami, then three three at Florida, one at Akron. Okay, so mostly Florida. Uh, I only heard about him this morning. I knew nothing of him prior. Uh, was with the Jaguars real quick, cup of coffee, and then released. So I'll be frank with you. He just got here. He was wearing 28 this morning, ran a few plays. I don't know what to think of him. Yeah, I, I don't know. Same with you. I didn't really know who this was prior to this morning. Uh, you got to keep one thing in mind, though, that this time of year isn't just about finding guys for the 53 man roster. They could be looking at possible guys, you know, as backup plans for the practice squad, perhaps, you know, we are talking about the, the four running backs, three of which we are seem to, you know, potentially be battling for two spots. Well, if one of them ends up getting cut and picked up by another team, you know, the giants are going to want to have someone on the practice squad at the running back position. That is a position you need some you need one guy at least on the practice mm-hmm. squad maybe this is you know giving him a look for that spot that's a on great the practice point. squad that is a really good point matt because jay sean corbin was waved injured he was waved injured and obviously he's just that sailors is gone so right now there wouldn't be a guy that's familiar with the system t- ready to take that spot on the practice squad so and believe me you need running backs on the practice squad because they help you run plays on the scout team during the season for sure and that is just that's just my my guess i mean obviously he's got a chance to make the team he's got a couple of weeks to prove himself but you know given the other three guys have been here now and have already been playing well he's definitely a little bit behind the eight ball but you never know Few yeah, kickoff, that, that few made... kickoff returns. By the way, at college, I was just looking here, seven kickoff returns during his career uh, over the course of his time at the NCAA level. So very limited return experience. He, he, I would suggest he's probably a running back, not a return guy. All right, that, yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of what I was able to look up to, and I was just curious. But that that makes a lot of sense, Matt. Yeah, now, we, we, we haven't talked to anybody about, about him, so we don't have any really <laughs> thing to add. Fair enough. No, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I, uh, the other guy I wanted to ask about who has been there for a little while, um, the Syracuse guy that I, I've kind of caught wind of a while back when he was in high school because he's kind of an athletic freak. He has really high RAS score, which the Giants seem to be putting sort of a premium on this year, it seemed like, going throughout uh, a lot of the process. Uh, and so Casey Rogers, the defensive tackle, and I know that there's yeah. a lot of guys right now fighting for that spot, uh, but I've been kind of rooting for that guy as a, as a hometown guy since he got there. 
I mean, I thought, you know, I saw him, you know, kind of towards the end of the game, mm-hmm. uh, in the, the preseason game. And, you know, I know we're talking about we're playing against third stringers at this point, but I, I felt like you saw a little bit of that athleticism, and you actually saw him kind of in the mix on a couple plays there towards the end. And I just was wondering, since obviously I'm not there for camp, if, if you guys can shed any light on it. If you've seen anything from him or any, any sort of sparks or any, any opportunity that you think maybe – Maybe he squeaks his way onto a practice squad or maybe makes the roster. Is there, is there any chance, you think, for, for my guy Casey Rogers? I'll tell you this. He's flashed throughout camp on occasion and did make a couple plays the other night where he was noticeable from the sideline. But having said that, okay, uh, the Giants coaching staff has pretty much talked about how deep this defensive line room is. So he has a heck of a mountain to climb. If he's going to make the 53, I, I think practice squad is much more realistic. Yeah, I was going to say, he he definitely has played well since the start of training camp. Like, he is one of those guys that done things. Are, is at, you know, the bottom of this uno, the unofficial depth chart right now at his position, but has really flashed and, like, has stood out compared to some of the other guys that he seems to be competing with. Now, as Paul mentioned, like, there is a lot of good competition at defensive tackle for the 53-man roster, as of right now, like he definitely has a very uphill battle to make the 53-man roster. But he does seem like, I would think, a prime candidate that the Giants would potentially want to try to get onto the practice squad, as you mentioned. I think he's definitely shown enough to be in consideration for one of those spots, yeah. And really, the problem there is that if you really believe the room is as deep as this coaching staff thinks... Chances are that's where some of the claims are going to other teams. There, there's nothing that says you're going to be able to hold on to him. You may want it's very true. badly to keep him in the room, but you know there's such a thing as showing a little too much, and then all of a sudden you get scapped up. That is true. Awesome. I appreciate it, guys. That's all I had. Great work as always, and uh, talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, appreciate Alex. the phone call. Call us again. 201-939-4513 is our phone number here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. So the practices will continue for the next couple of days of another padded one tomorrow. Yep. Uh, and then again on uh, Wednesday, they will have uh, shells. No, I thought Thursday. I thought Wednesday What's was What's today? Off. Today's Monday. I thought Wednesday was an off day. Are we off Wednesday? I don't know. Every day, I just, I every just, day meshes together I, during well, training You know camp. why? Because I get in the car in the morning, and I just start it, and automatically it just drives here. I don't even worry about going to the store for, for groceries. I just immediately, the car just drives itself to the Giants complex. What yeah, are we doing? Wednesday, no availability. We're off Wednesday. Off Wednesday. Okay, and, and then, then Thursday. Thursday. So it's today, Tuesday, Thursday. Okay. And then, obviously, on Friday is the walkthrough and the jet to uh, Houston for the preseason game on Saturday. Now, Brian Dable did tell us earlier in the week, yesterday, as a matter of fact, that he wanted to get three really good practice sessions in this week, even though they're not all padded. Yep. Okay? He did say he wanted to do that. As he mentioned in our production meeting, and I'm not talking out of turn, because, again, we can't really tell you stuff that we're, we're told in that meeting, but he's like, hey, regular season's going to be here before you know it. The train is starting to get ready to pull out of the station. Got to get guys ready, which is one of the reasons why he has insisted that the starters will get a lot of snaps this week. You got to get them ready. You can't keep bubble wrap on them forever. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you look at the calendar. Three weeks from today, we will be here. It is the Monday leading into week one. They will be fully game prepping for the Vikings. Three weeks from today. I don't know where the last couple of weeks... They've kind of flown by and at the same time. They really have. Flown by at the same time. Felt like we've crawled through them. (laughs) Just the dog days of training camp. But yeah, week one is going to be here before we know it. And you definitely, you want to get your guy, you want to be safe with your guys. And we spoke about this before training camp started. Mm -hmm. You want to be safe with your guys, especially your starters. But at the same time, you can't expect guys to get no game reps all preseason step in you know to the huddle week one against the vikings and be playing at 100 percent. like it's i would think just a little unreasonable yeah to expect that i mean there's a reason why this whole the whole training camp is a basically a ramp up to week one it's to get guys ready for every aspect of it the mental aspect of the game especially the physical aspect of the game so yeah i mean even 
just looking at the the practice schedule of training camp, this was always the week that we thought the starters would play because last week two joint practices against the Lions, which mm-hmm. provide you a ample opportunity to get great reps and real reps. And then next week there's the joint practice against the Jets. And it's also the last preseason game closest to the start of the regular season. Someone gets banged up in that game, obviously less time to get back on the field for week one. So this weekend was always the game. I feel like a lot of us had circled as the big, the best possibility of seeing our starters and, you know, barring something crazy happening in practice these next few days, it seems like we're heading that way. Now, the biggest disappointment, and I think Carmen Brasillo, the offensive line coach, did mention this yesterday, is that at this point, they still haven't been able to get their assumed starting five offensive linemen on the field at the same time. That That's a regret. It's not something you have control over. JMS had the, the sore shoulder. And by the way, he did talk to the media today did not really have anything to say about that. So, as Dave's, as Dave's, and I, and I get that. That's fine. He's deflecting all of that. But the fact he was he was in pads all last week on the sideline. It wasn't like he was inside getting treatment. He was in pads watching everything. And then today they actually got him out to do some individuals. Okay, so he's clearly being ramped up. I don't think, and Coach would not confirm a hundred percent, but it's unlikely that he'll play against Houston, him and Neil. It's, yeah, it's, it's, mean, it's highly unlikely. I, yeah, I would say unless, you know, both of those guys or either one of them all of a sudden are doing every team rep in practice tomorrow, which I don't think that's going to happen. I doubt it too. Then I don't see how they would be ready right. to go here's for the Saturday. Here's the problem now. You got one joint practice with the Jets the following week and one game against the Jets at the end of that week. That may be the only time that you're going to be able to get these assumed starting five on the field together. That's a little later than they wanted it to be. For sure. Now, you got to make the best of it. It's reality. I tell people all the time, sometimes you have to chew on nails. That's just the way it is. Chew on those nails and digest. You don't have a choice. That's just the way it's fallen again this year. Uh, Will the Giants be able to come through that okay? Well... Look, we've talked about how Greg Van Roten can possibly factor into this equation several times. And it was brought up to Coach Priscillo yesterday that because he and Illuminor have played at the right guard and right tackle spot for a full season with the Raiders, if they decide to go with that combination, it will be easier for them to get on the field in week one. Yeah, I mean, that, for sure. And that I, I feel like Dable has sort of said that as well when asked about why are you, you know, giving Greg Van Roden all these snaps at center. He said, like, look, look this guy's been around the league for over a decade He now. knows how to play guard. He knows how to play guard. <laughs> he has not played much center in his career, so we want – I mean, Dable has been preaching this since the day he got here. We know that Brian Dable loves versatility. He loves guys being able to play more than one position. De- obviously, depending on – what position we're talking about but for offensive linemen he likes guys that can play multiple spots i mean we've seen it the last couple of years with joshua zudu with him going between tackle and guard and i believe it was carmen brasillo yesterday when asked about Azudu specifically he literally said we want to get this guy as many reps at tackle as we can in case we need him to step in there he can still play guard we know he can play guard but we want to get him prepared to play multitude of positions Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing with Greg Van Roden, except that's a guy that's been doing it for a decade now. Just had his best, what he said, his best year of his career last year mm-hmm. at guard, playing under Carmen Brasillo with Luminor next to him. Like, that is not something that they're going to need, I don't think, would need, you know, weeks and weeks of practice to get themselves game ready to play those positions. Talk about Van Roden and Luminor especially. I feel like they, you know, Give them a, a couple of days of practice, and they'll be ready to go. By the way, did you see the one-on-ones today, the O-line, D-line? That was the other thing I wanted to Bri- – if Brian we had Burns time. gave Illuminor one heck of a rough time today. That is actually what I wanted. If we had time, I was hoping well, that we could get to we got a minute left. I, wanted, get I kind to of wanted to touch that. There were two main takeaways I got from watching the offensive, defensive line one-on-ones. Brian Burns, very good at football. <laughs> 
like the way you said that. Andrew Thomas, also very good at football. Yes. Those two, if they can stay healthy, I like maybe I'm you know a little too close to it, but like I don't see how both of those guys don't have great seasons if they are able to stay healthy from what they've shown this summer. I know it's it's a lot of it, pretty much all of it for those two guys has just been practice, but. You know, we got a glimpse of them getting to face the Detroit Lions, who mm-hmm. have what many people consider to be the best offensive line. And that's during the week, in by the, the way. League. Make sure they understand. Yeah, yeah, joint practices. The joint, the two joint practices. Right. The Lions, by many people, consider them to have the best offensive line in the league. If They're not really number good. one, They're good. top three. Real good. And Brian Burns was getting around Panay Sewell and Taylor Decker. Not every rep, but a lot of, a lot of snaps. Like it was nothing. And Andrew Thomas was doing the same thing, but blocking Aiden Hutchinson. I don't know who their other starting edge Tyler rusher. No, no, the edge rusher, the starting oh, oh, oh. opposite Aiden Hutchinson. Oh. Whoever it was, Andrew Thomas looked like I essentially forget. like a brick wall. Like nothing was getting by him. And just today at practice, basically for both of those guys, no matter who they were facing, that's what we saw almost every snap. Brian Burns was putting some moves on Jermaine Illuminor, who's had a very great, strong you know, start to the training camp mm-hmm. himself. Mm-hmm. But he was putting some moves on Illuminor and like sort of just making them look silly, which like, is not easy to do because Jermaine Illuminor is a big, tough guy who is very good at right tackle. And Brian Burns was just putting moves on him. And I was standing there. I'm like, how the heck did he just do that? Yeah. Yeah. Burns, Burns has tremendous pliability and length. And those two things together really make him a major problem for any tackle trying to block him off the edge. Yeah. It's just, it's a nightmare. It's, and, and, and I don't think he got enough credit because he was buried in Carolina. Mm-hmm. And outside of Derek Brown, who else in that front seven gave anybody any trouble at all? I think he had one year with Hassan Reddick. I mean, yeah. I think. Yeah. Years ago, though. And, and, right. And, and so, you know, to what you said a minute ago about, you know, kind of quality of those two guys... Um, Andrew Thomas has been second team all NFL and Brian Burns has gone to the Pro Bowl. So these guys have already had some accolades. I'll go, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go with you on this and I'm going to say both of those guys will have career years. If they stay healthy, I can easily see that happening. And, and I, I say both of them are going to be awarded at the end of the season. I think so too. I would too. be very surprised because it's, it's right there in front of us. We could see it. Yeah, I mean, look, again, I, I don't want to keep harping on those joint practices I know. with the Lions. I but know. Panay Sewell is an, it was a first-team All-Pro tackle last yep. year. And Brian Burns was getting by him with relative ease. Yeah. So guess what? Folks, you want to double Brian Burns? Tibbs will eat you for lunch. Or Dexter. Or Thank both. You. Enjoy. <laughs> that will do it for this edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. We are here every weekday from 1 p.m. Eastern time for one hour to talk Giants football. Jot down the number 201-939-4513. From Outside Tech, I'm Paul Dottino. We'll see you next time. It's time for today's Lucky Land Horoscope with Victoria Cash. Life's gotten mundane, so shake up the daily routine and be adventurous with a trip to Lucky Land. You know what they say. Your chance to win starts with a spin. So go to LuckyLandSlots.com to play over 100 social casino-style games for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Get lucky today at LuckyLandSlots.com. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Stay Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo. No making smarter financial moves today. Secures a financial freedom for a successful tomorrow. Now we have a level of privilege that our parents never had. So what do we do with it, right? How do, we, how do we utilize the opportunities that we have that they don't, right? And a lot of that is educating ourselves, educating ourselves on how to not make the same mistakes they did. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. State Farm, proud sponsor of My Cultura Podcast Network.